Hey everybody, welcome to video number four in the how to set up your first marine aquarium series. This series video, we're gonna talk about lighting, heating, cooling, and circulation. So let's jump right in. First of all, uh, go ahead and subscribe, like, ask any questions. I will answer them as quickly as I can. I apologize, I have a little cold today, so if I sound a little funny, that is why. Okay, first up, we're gonna talk about lighting. <clears throat> There really are three types of lighting for your reef aquarium. Uh, LED, metal halide, and T5 fluorescence. Plus there's various hybrid options where you're mixing those. And I just wanna talk about kind of the pros and cons of each one. And then you can do your own research and see what's gonna work best for you. <clears throat> for some absolutely great videos on this topic, go to YouTube. Uh, go to BRS TV, check out their station, their 52 weeks of reefing series, videos 18 through 21. They go in depth on each one of these um, lighting considerations. So it's a really good resource. First thing to consider when we're talking about lighting is understanding what PAR is. You'll hear that term a lot. It's photosynthetic active radiation. And what that basically means is it's the spectral range, so the, the, the wavelength of light of solar radiation that photosynthetic organisms are able to use for photosynthesis. So basically, um, plants, corals, anemones, you know, everything that uses uh, photosynthesis for its energy um, can't use all kinds of light. It can only use uh, PAR, photosynthetic active radiation. So when we're talking in the lighting world, we're really gonna be talking about what is the PAR rating. And um, we used to talk about something else. We used to talk about watts per gallon, but that really doesn't work at all anymore because uh, of, of LED lighting. Um, LED lighting is uh, very good. It does not use much energy, so the whole watts per gallon doesn't work anymore. So what we do wanna talk about is PAR. Um, you can find out PAR ratings by just Googling them. For example, if you look at these radions, if you're persistent enough, you can uh, find some PAR ratings at various depths. Um, so something you can definitely Google. You can also purchase your own PAR meter. They're a little expensive to get a good one, um, and so most hobbyists don't have them, but it's something you can purchase if you're really interested. Um, because as you progress in the hobby, once you start adding corals, you will need a certain amount of PAR to sustain them and so that means you will have to place them at various heights within the water column so that they're closer or further away from from lights um, yeah so that's a basic overview of PAR so uh, first we're going to talk about LED lights all right uh, you can see I have the radions which if you watch my videos that's the XR15 Pro which is their smaller one um, and they have the XR30 which is basically double the size um, they are probably close to the most expensive for the initial cost. Um, that being said, they are gonna be way cheaper than any other option in over, over, over 10 years. Um, the thing about LEDs is they are relatively new to the hobby. Um, you know, five years ago, people were not sure if if they produce enough par, or maybe they produced a lot of par in their first year, but then they decreased heavily. But as years have gone on, reefers have had a lot of success. And you can expect your uh, LED lights to last for somewhere around 10 years. That's kind of the hope. Um, so yeah, so if they last 10 years, that's amazing. And if you're put, putting out five, six, $700, but that's over 10 years, that is gonna be way cheaper than replacing bulbs every single year. You never have to replace LED bulbs. Once the fixture is done, you just purchase a new one and hopefully that's five to 10 years. LEDs use significantly less energy. You're gonna save on your energy costs um, and you're not gonna have to probably do a lot of rewiring in your apartment or house in order to make sure you have enough ampage for your lights because they don't really take, take that many watts, that many amps. Um, they produce little heat, little to no heat. Um, I'm not going to say no heat, but very, very tiny amounts of heat. Uh, so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, it adding heat to your aquarium. You, if, you know, you're not going to need to buy a chiller just because you have LED lights. Um, the cool thing about radions and about other programmable LEDs is that you can program them across the color spectrum. 
You can go from 0% intensity to 100% intensity. You can go, you know, from 5,000K to 20,000K. So you can get anything from the blues, the purples, the whites, you know, everything in the spectrum so that you can really make your corals and your fish pop or you can choose a spectral choice that is going to enhance growth the most. Um, that being said, most of us are not lighting experts, so having this much programmability really doesn't matter. Um, but it's nice that it's there. Uh, the thing about LED lights is uh, they're super easy to mount. They come oftentimes with some fancy mounting systems. You can hang them from the ceiling pretty easily. Um, top brands are probably the Ecotec Radions that you see here. Kessels, which I actually kind of wish I went with Kessels. Uh, they just have this beautiful shimmer. They're really compact, really beautiful. There's also AI, Aqua Illumination, Hydra. Um, really cool looking as well. Very similar looking to the Radeon. Uh, and then the Max Spec Razor, um, also another cool option. Another thing about Radeons is um, a lot of them are Wi-Fi capable. So you can use them with a controller or you can purchase a separate controller and you can program them from away, which is really cool. Um, my settings on my Radeon, um, you know, I have mine set to about 50% power, um, which, you know, I probably would never go above 70, 75% once I add corals, because I've heard a lot of stories of, of having 75% or higher with these Radeon XR15s and your corals bleaching. So I have mine set about 50%. I run on a 12 hour cycle, sunrise uh, is 8 a.m., sunset 8 p.m. It does ramp up, you know, it has a lot of blues in the morning and then for about a four or five hour period of kind of its high intensity, a lot of whites, basically I just add in the whites with the blues and then it cycles back down. The cool thing about the Radeons that I really like is I have um, lightning storms programmed into my lights as well as cloudiness programmed in. Um, and also a moon cycle, which simulates the lunar cycle. So really cool options there. Uh, the downside of LEDs, um, there's just not as much proof that they work in the long run. You know, um, you know they don't have the quite the shimmering effect as some other lighting sources. So good choice. I definitely recommend LEDs, but let's talk about some other ones. Next up is metal halide. And metal halide is the longest uh, light used in the hobby. There are these little tiny bulbs if you check out online um, and they uh, have a proven track record of success. Um, they are have really high par outputs. We know that you can have a successful LPS and SPS tank with metal halide. It's great for pretty much any coral. Um, you do have to replace your metal, metal halide bulbs annually. So that's a cost you want to um, add in when you're making that decision. Halides have an amazing shimmer effect, you know, that kind of natural shimmer that you see on a reef. Uh, it's just beautiful with a metal halide. Uh, so just absolutely beautiful there. There are so many different bulbs to choose from. So you can really uh, read a lot of reviews on the different bulbs and, and pinpoint exactly the kind of bulb you want. They do run very hot. And for those of you who run metal halides or are thinking about it, you're going to probably want add a fan um, to kind of uh, blow um, some of that heat away. Uh, you also may end up having to buy a chiller and chillers are very expensive pieces of equipment. Um, the other thing about metal halides is you have to choose your reflectors because metal halides just throw off light in all directions. So you put a reflector on and around it and there are different ones to choose from depending on your size of tank. Um, you know, so that you can, you know, spread out that metal highlight light or pinpoint it more. It's really kind of up to you. Um, okay, and then the last kind are called T5 fluorescents. Basically, think of your just normal fluorescent long light bulbs, but T5s are thinner, right? Um, and usually T5s are able to have reflectors around individual bulbs, <clears throat> so the, the light really is focused on the tank. Long track record of success with T5s. So you're gonna absolutely have success with them. <clears throat> um, you have even light distribution. They're basically plug and play. You're not gonna be doing any sorts of fancy programming like you have to think about with your Radeons. You know, you're gonna plug them in and you're gonna set them. You know, they might be an on off. You know, with your, you might have different kinds of bulbs. You know, so you might start out with your actinic bulbs and then midday turn on all the light bulbs. So it's just gonna be a very, very simple kind of setup. 
they don't have much heat, so you don't really have to worry about the heat they produce. Um, the initial setup is going to be cheap, but they are probably the most expensive to operate in the long run because every single year you have to replace those individual bulbs, and they can be pretty pricey. But the the upside is they have a beautiful shimmer as well. No heat, very little heat, a beautiful shimmer, and a cheap initial cost. So it's really up to you. And some of the the coolest um, lighting fixtures out there are. Are, are hybrids of you know T5s LEDs or um, T, or metal halides LEDs. All right, moving on to uh, heating and cooling. Um, I don't have a fan, but the fan is the easiest way you're going to be cooling your uh, tank. Uh, fan help keep um, air blown across the surface of the water, which is going to help that heat dissipate. You can have a fan up on the outside of your display tank or in the sump. Um, if you have LED lights and you live in a cool climate like I do in Seattle, probably not going to be necessary except maybe in the summer. A chiller. I'm not going to talk much about chillers. Uh, if you live in a hot, humid climate or even in some place like Seattle but you live in a stuffy apartment, you may have to buy a chiller. Um, if, if your apartment or home is air-conditioned well, you're not going to have to worry about it as much. But if it's not air-conditioned, you know, you're going to see some heat spikes in the summer. So you may have to consider buying a chiller. They are expensive. Um, and if you do go the metal halide route, you're probably going to have to buy a chiller. Just an extra cost um, to your system. Okay, heaters. You can see here, I've gone with the Eheim Jaeger. Um, I absolutely love them. For heaters, there's, there's really not much to talk about. Um, read the reviews. You know, you're going to have glass, ceramic, composite type heaters. They're all going to function very similarly, and you want to find something that has a long track record of success and is reliable. So go to Bulk Resupply, go to Marine Depot, go to TB Aquatics, go to Amazon, and read the reviews. Um, <clears throat> your heaters are going to be some of the uh, some of the uh, most high wattage equipment. Um, so just keep that in mind that you know your heaters are going to use quite a bit of electricity. And some people want to buy a heater that is twice as powerful for their tank, thinking that they'll just be able to use it less and it will increase its life. Don't do that. Buy the perfect size heater, because if you buy a heater that's too big, if it ever malfunctions, it can completely fry your tank. Instead of buying a larger heater, select the perfect wattage that is just right for the size of your tank and buy two of them. Then you're gonna take the first one and you're gonna set it to the temperature you want it, and then your second one is your backup and you're gonna set it to turn on at just below the other one. So let's say you have your main one set for 78, your backup's gonna be set for 76. So one day when you come home and you're, oh my gosh, my tank's only at 76 degrees. You know your primary heater has gone out, time to buy a new one, and you can kind of start the cycle again. So don't double the size, just buy two, two perfect size. And, and, and that's definitely what I would recommend there. Make sure you place them in a high flow area um, a lot of people put them in the sump. That's a great spot for them. Uh, make sure it's a nice flow area. I put mine in the overflow box. Also works uh, quite well. Um, yeah, I would say just purchase a high rated heater. Your choice. Um, I really like these Eheim Jaegers. I have two 75 watt, no, two 125 watts and a 75 watt heater is for my mixing bucket. So you're probably gonna want three. You're gonna want two for your display tank and you're gonna want one for your mixing container because to mix your salt water, you wanna make sure it's heated to the correct temperature and that it's circulated. Um, so I have three uh, total. Um, something that um, is important to know is don't, don't trust that the temperature is gonna be correct because a lot of times they'll come and you'll think, oh, it says 76, so it's 76 degrees, but they can be off by four or five degrees. So I would recommend purchasing a high accuracy thermometer so that you can calibrate your heater correctly. But you know what, an easier way to go about that is, um, yes, get the thermometer, but then purchase a controller. You can get a cheap controller. Um, you know, a Neptune Apex Junior is an expensive option. There's other options out there. But these will basically, you plug it into your controller and you tell your controller you want it set at 78 degrees, plus or minus 0.2, and it will keep your heat exactly tuned into where you want to. Um, and most marine tanks you're going to find are going to be between 76 degrees and 84 degrees. Moving right along uh, to circulation. 
Um, you can see here the CJ pump. I absolutely love CJ pumps. Um, there are really two kinds of pumps, okay? There are AC pumps and DC pumps, and I am not an electricity person at all. But uh, basically, it's like this. AC pumps are always gonna be fixed gallon per hour. DC pumps can have variable outputs, all right? DC pumps are also going to run a lot quieter, okay? But also more expensive, generally speaking. Um, you know, biggest thing with pumps is, um, is noise, uh, but noise can be mitigated pretty easily um, by a couple things. You can use silicone tubing um, to attach it. So instead of putting some sort of flexible tubing here, just put silicone tubing. It's more expensive. Bulk resupply does sell it and that will minimize a lot of the sound. Just make sure you use a hose clamp with it. Um, but you can also buy some silicone pads um, that you can put underneath it or anywhere that it's touching the glass. And that will help a lot. Um, high flow is really important in your tank and it's important for several reasons one keeping the water moving inhibits uh detritus from from building up so it's going to keep detritus floating which is then going to get sucked into your overflow and filtered out number two it increases oxygenation the biggest way your reef aquarium is going to get oxygen is through the water movement on the surface of the tank and by keeping circulation, you're going to keep it moving up and down, which will increase the, the, the oxygenation. Number three is it helps recreate the moving water of a reef, especially if you get a DC sort of wave maker. It can, it can absolutely simulate that reef environment, which is going to be really helpful for all of your livestock. And lastly, it has nutrient transport. Um, some of your, your, your livestock might be filter feeders, and you need good water movement to be able to keep plankton and various other things moving through uh, your tank. Okay, so let's talk about the different kinds of circulation methods. First up are return pumps. Things to know for return pumps, gallons per hour, all right? So this is a CJ Synchro Silent 3.0. It has 714 gallons per hour, okay? Um, adjustable speed, okay? So if it's a DC pump, you know, these are AC pumps. DC pumps might have an adjustable speed, which is gonna have a wide range of gallons per hour. Is it submersible, meaning you put it in water or external? You know, um, most of us with smaller tanks have submersible ones, you just place the pump right in the water. But um, you can also plumb them, plumb a lot of pumps to be external, and there are, and there are benefits to doing that as well. Um, but you, you have to remember, so let's say your tank uh, let's say you, you, you realize that your tank's ideal gallon per hour rate is going to be something like a thousand gallons per hour, okay? If you buy a pump that's a thousand gallons per hour, it's not going to be the right one because you're going to get much less than that. And here's why. Head pressure, when water comes out, decreases due to several factors. One, the length of the tubing. The longer it takes for the water to get from your pump to where it's going, it's going to slow down and decrease the output. Number two is the height of the water. How high are you pumping it? Are you pumping it just up to your, uh, your tank or are you pumping it up a floor? You know, you're gonna lose tons and tons and tons of gallons per hour of head pressure with, with, with every foot you go up. And number three is if, if you hard plumb your system, every joint you have in your hard plumbing is gonna decrease the pressure. So like I said, if you want a thousand gallon per hour flow, you will need to purchase a pump that is rated for higher than that and then use some online calculators to determine exactly um, how much pressure you're going to lose based on the height and based on how much tubing that you have. Um, you pretty much use return pumps to uh, return water um, from your sump, um, your hang on the back, refugium, something like that uh, in two your display tank, but you also use it to power protein skimmers. Um, my protein skimmer uses a CJ Synchro 3.0 um, to really hyper, hyper drive that. Okay, uh, second type of circulation is power heads. And power heads are uh, either fixed rate or variable, again. Um, and they are often used inside of a display tank. Um, they are also used, I use um, a power head to mix, constantly mix the water in my salt water mixing containers. Um, you can put a power head in your sump to keep detritus suspended in, in the air so that it can't settle anywhere and rot and that way it'll get filtered out. And you also use power heads 
to power media reactors. So I have a I have a phosphate reactor and I have a carbon reactor and I have I have two small power heads that are used <coughs> to pump water through that. Wave makers, when people talk about them, um, are are just controllable power heads. They are DC power heads. So vortex, tunesies, all those um, kind of wave makers are uh, just power heads, basically, that help pump the water. Um, yeah, um, Tunzi, Ecotech, others, you can make them fully programmable. But you know what? You, what you can also do to make your own programmable power head is you can just buy a cheap power head, connect it into a, a controller of some kind, and then tell it when to turn on and off at variable settings to create a pulsing effect or something like that. But most of us are just going to end up buying a, a DC power head like a like a Vortec MP10 or you know MP um, or TuneZ, all those sort of things. The cool thing that I like about the uh, Ecotech, the Vortex, are um, it has it. it that's obviously magnetic, right? Which you've seen on the side of mine. Um, but all of the electronics are on the outside, on the dry side, and you have a very small um, portion that goes inside the tank, so it looks great. Um, but yeah, just check them out. Um, check out Wave Makers. There's tons of good options out there for you. <clears throat> Another kind of pump are dosing pumps. Dosing pumps are very, very, very slow rate pumps, you know, millimeters per minute, millimeters per hour sort of thing. They're mainly used for dosing two-part, your calcium and alkalinity solution. Some people use them for dosing caulk washer to help keep their pH up. Um, or some people use them in a smaller system for their auto top-off to just gradually um, add fresh water to their tank. They are not necessary by any means, um, but uh, if you do have corals, you're going to find you're going to have to be dosing daily calcium and alkalinity, and this will just make your life much, much easier. The last kind I'm going to talk about here uh, is an air pump. Just what it says, an air pump pumps air. Um, if you were in the freshwater hobby years ago, you would have a little bubble air stone, and people still have those. You know, when you see the bubbles in the tank, those are little air stones that are pumped through air pumps. Um, they're not necessary in a marine aquarium as long as you have adequate circulation that keeps the water moving in your display tank. But it's always good to have a battery-powered air pump with an uh, air stone as backup in case the power ever goes out. That way you can keep oxygenating your tank. The last part of circulation is plumbing. I'm not going to go in depth there because I could talk forever about plumbing. But uh, you, can, you can hard plumb a system. And that means using Schedule 40 or 80 PVC. Schedule 40 just being a thinner, Schedule 80 being a thicker, more industrial um, kind of, of PVC. Um, and, you know, basically you just have to learn how to cut it. You need to get all the right plumbing parts. You need to learn how to glue them together, you know. Um, and there's plenty of videos you can watch on how to do that. But instead of doing that, you can also just use different kinds of flexible tubing. Um, which is definitely going to be easier um, to do. Although, if you really like the nice clean look, you're probably going to want a hard plumb. But <clears throat> if you buy an all-in-one system or an in-between system like a reefer, the plumbing is going to be done for you. So it's really quite simple. Okay, that was uh, the video today. I hope that was helpful as an introduction. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, next up, I'm going to be discussing media reactors and filtration. So please stay tuned for that. And thanks for watching everybody.